I appreciate you for coming on to the Storage Investor Nation webinar. And today we're going to be talking about choosing a partner for self-storage investing. Now I'm going to share my screen here. So everyone can see, because I, I like to present with visuals. So a little bit about me. I, my name is Taylor Koo. I'm one of the investor relations associates at PassiveInvesting.com. And like I said, I live in San Jose, California. I graduated with a mechanical engineering degree and was able to dance on Jimmy Come Alive and build some beautiful restaurants. So you can actually see me there in the background. Uh, here are some of the restaurants that I've built. Uh, surprisingly, they were only Asian restaurants, um, but that's a, that's a different topic. <laughs> now, everything was going well and uh, with, with my job until COVID happened and we lost all of our jobs. And at this time, I knew I've always wanted to get into commercial real estate, try and leverage some of my knowledge and expertise and try and get into the acquisition side. Uh, and this sort of forced my hand into, you know, why not start now? But at this time when COVID did start, I didn't have the luxury of going to in-person meetups and I didn't have the capital to join a prestigious mastermind or mentorship group. So a lot of the strategies that I used was from online strategies of figuring out how to find partners, add value to them, uh, and, and uh, you know, just create connections in different states. And so, so that's what I did. And actually, before I even got into this, I met an operator on the other side of the nation, whom I reached out to about an article that he wrote. And I was personally in the discovery phase of seeing how I can add value. And after a few conversations of digging through their criteria, the biggest problem that I found with them was finding deals. With me not having a lot of capital and a lot of time, I was thinking I could help them find a deal. I found out where they were looking and reached out to a virtual assistant. I pulled a list of all the owners that they had in the area so I could cold call. And keep in mind, I was working a full-time job at the time too. And I lived in a state that was two hours behind. And so after work, I would call, get rejected, call, get rejected. Eventually I found a person who was willing to sell. So I told the operator to go tour the property and then I actually heard nothing. I remember getting the financials, not necessarily knowing what to look for, how to underwrite. And then, you know, I think a couple of weeks later, I, I found out that the deal never went through. Uh, but throughout this process, I found out four things about myself. Uh, number one, I really wasn't that great at deal sourcing. I never visited the, the state. I didn't have any broker relationships. Uh, number two, I didn't have any broker relationships. I needed to coordinate with the operator schedule. And then after all that coordination, someone else might've toured the deal the same day. And so my local presence just wasn't strong. Uh, I also really didn't like cold calling these owners and I didn't enjoy it. And then also I wasn't the best at underwriting. I could barely articulate what I was really looking for in a deal. Uh, but the reason why I talk about this story is when we are looking for partners, we have to take into account our own strengths. You know, we're, we have to realize that we're not good at everything and we don't have the time to do everything. And when we partner up with, you know, especially if you're doing syndications or, you know, keeping it uh a, well, especially with syndications and keeping it as just a small partnership, a partnership, especially if you have other investors in there, it gives people more comfort to know that they're dealing with more than just one person. And investors are going to also realize that they're, you're not going to be good at everything. And when they interview you in figuring out if they wanted to invest with you, they're going to for sure figure out who is, who is actually in the deal and working the, the days, um, uh, the in and outs of the day-to-day -day operations. And also, if it's only one person, it's easier, it's easier for them to dip out to the Grand Caymans or wherever, wherever uh, you know, whatever vacation spot they're trying to go. And this is actually one of uh, Dan's red flags. He wrote an article about vetting operators is making sure that there's more than one person that's full-time in the business. And so when we 
when we start to go on this partner uh, journey of, of finding how we can add value, what we really need to do is we need to find out what we're good at. What are we not good at? The people that we look up to, what are those mentors that we look up to? What are they truly good at? Because I mean, if you if you like a certain mentor, you're going to have similar qualities, characters, characteristics, and and skills. I mean, for for me, yeah, I could call all these all these owners in that area, but I hated it. I sucked at it. Uh, I, I, I got rejected so many times and maybe that's just the, the way of the game, but also at the same time, it's, it really is, it wasn't what I enjoyed. And so taking an inventory of what you really do like versus, and your strengths, and then figuring out what those weaknesses where you lack is where you're going to find the next partnership. And so just take an inventory. What excites you? What do you, what do you dread? What do you fear? Where are you lacking? And so when you start to develop certain skill sets on your own, they could either be in sourcing, broker relationships, underwriting, asset management. Maybe you have the balance sheet to sign off on a loan. Maybe you're great at due diligence and you're very detail-oriented. Um, or maybe you have a very extensive uh, capital raising network and you can bring equity into a deal. And so especially speaking on, on behalf of the general partnerships, you're typically going to be falling uh, in between one of these five categories when you are looking for a partner. You either fall into the acquisitions, uh, asset management, underwriter, key sponsor, or co GP slash capital raiser. And you know, one person can take over. You know, I would say, let's say a couple of them, because uh, there's typically there could be three to five general partners, but making sure that these are defined responsibilities uh, is really vital, especially as you go through, uh, you know, finding these different partners. But the key part of when we do jump onto this journey of finding different partners is knowing how to add value and, and knowing where to add value. And when we are a good partner, we have to really think about this like a marriage or like when we are relationships, uh, when we, it, we really have to just, just because they, they fill in the gaps does not make these people good partners for us. Just because I'm great at acquisitions and the other person's great at asset management doesn't necessarily mean that, and we have complementary skill sets, doesn't necessarily mean that it's always going to work out. And so with these high quality partnerships, we, may, we need to make sure that we're adding value, but more importantly, understanding and at the end of the day, trusting them that we are aligned. And when we are looking for partners and we're looking to, to try and add value, the, I mean, we hear it all the time in, in meetups or, you know, in-person meetups or, or networking in general. It's like, oh, how can, how can I add value to you? How can I add value to you? Imagine if we, if, if we went up to that beautiful person in the bar and we ask him, Hey, how, you know, you, you are, you are a person that I'm interested in. How can I add value to you? No, one's really going to take you seriously. If you're looking for a partner and you go up to them and say, Hey, do you want to be my partner? Hey, you want to be my friend? It may have worked in kindergarten, but now it's, it's a completely different game as we get older because we're a lot more complex human beings. And so uh, a large part of where we come in in terms of finding a partner is one, taking account what we know and what we can add and being confident in that, but then seeking and understanding for the person that we're vetting as a potential partner. We need to seek understanding and uncover the challenges with, uh, I mean, you can directly ask, but I mean, I'm personally uh, have always had that issue too. Because sometimes I'm saying like, "Oh, I." If someone asks me how can I add value, I'm like, uh, "I, you, you know, it, it, it's even hard. It's it's hard for me to even say, right?" And so once you dive in and learn about them and figuring out, you know, what, um, you know, if your goals are aligned, uh, are they the person that you need? And just important just as important, are you the person that they need? Um, how do they communicate? You know, how do they handle stressful 
situations? Do they have the same mindsets on the business plan? Do they have the same risk profile? Um, do they do they want more of a long-term hold where they refinance a year five and then just hold forever? Maybe they're trying to do more of these short-term syndications. That is really uncovering what that person is, what their goals are, what and if their values align. Because if those values and goals align, they're not gonna they're they're not gonna work out. And so when we do go and find partners, understand that it goes beyond these complementary skill sets. You know, it's just like dating where we're learning about the other person. Now, as you're starting to learn about the other person, you need to make sure that you define your expectations. Now, don't define, define expectations too soon. Uh, really take, your, take, take it slow. Take your time with this. Uh, because if you're going to buy self-storage facilities, these transactions can go for multiple years. You know, it's like you're, it, it really is like being in a marriage. And so when the time is ready and you have your goals and values aligned, uh, make sure that there's the conversation. If this is what I'm great at, this is what you're great at. We're going to stick to our own lane. Uh, in partnerships within passiveinvesting.com, if there's any way or form of, um, I guess, cross pollination where some uh, let's say like I'll use investor services and investor relations where investor relations could be answering a question that investor services doesn't need to be taking on, but they're taking on. We can handle that because their focus should be somewhere else. And then creating that safe space in order for us to call each other out and be accountable of our own actions and execution uh, should, uh, should be enough to really push that partnership forward. So, what we really also want to avoid is owing each other as well. Um, so settle up as often as you can. Uh, and at the end of the day, you know, when we are communicating with these partners, you have to figure out, do you know them? Do you like them? Do you trust them? It's the same as where we go with passive investors as well, or LPs. Uh, is Do they know, like, and trust you? Same with your partners. Do you know, like, and trust them? Can you trust them that they're going to be aligned with the same goals that you have? Yeah, and then, you know, when we, when we communicate too, communicate often. Maybe meeting once, once a week might not be enough. You know, talking about what you're working on, how's it going? Are you uh, completing all these steps to achieving your goals? Maybe there needs to be a pivot. Uh, it, using this, uh, the first story that I had with um, with that operator over on the East Coast, we I tried communicating, and there wasn't. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I didn't hear back from them, and so that was also a, a telling story too, saying like, "Hey, I don't really like the way that this person's communicating. I don't necessarily know if I want to add time or um, spend as much time with them as as I'd like." Right now. Now that we define what we are looking for in a partner and taking into account what we have as a strength and what value that can we can bring to the table, the next step is where do we where do we look for in a partner? You know, do we do you know? I mean, the easy one is do you know people that are successful in real estate within your own personal network? Can you do referrals? Uh, do you know any real estate bankers, attorneys, CPAs, any mentors? Um, there's, there's plenty of ways that we can find partners, but you also have to make sure when you are looking for these partners, you want to make sure that you're adding value and curating that high quality relationship. So first strategy, uh, I know that people like to use this as bigger pockets. And I know some people have found partners in bigger pockets, but the challenge with bigger pockets is I feel like a lot of them are mostly focused on residential. Um, and, you know, finding people, especially within self-storage, I, you know, there could be a lot of people, but night might not be the best market for finding different, um, partners just because, you know, frankly, I don't really see too many there, but I mean, it's hard to discredit it just because of how big bigger pockets is and how well-known bigger pockets is. And so, you know, definitely, uh, a strong suit. Same with, uh, another one in-person meetups, 
I mean, you can go on Facebook and on meetup.com. There's typically, you know, maybe a commercial real estate forum uh, or commercial real estate group that is maybe focused on self-storage. I personally haven't seen too many around my area over in California, but it definitely is a great place to check, um, you know, in your respective states or areas. Now, the other, the, the, these next three are some of my favorite ones, uh, especially, and these are the ones that I utilized when I was trying to find partners being over in California and trying to build relationships online and out of state was virtual meetups. You can see them on Facebook, on LinkedIn. And I mean, typically there's just going to be, there's, there's virtual meetups happening pretty much every single day. And the the beautiful thing about this is you can jump into a different virtual meetup and uh, in a, in a completely different state and still build relationships with them. Sometimes there's going to be a topic that they want to talk about, uh, but then afterwards there's typically a networking uh, forum or a breakout rooms where you can just meet other people and say, Hey, I'm in this place, focus on this. Uh, And, you know, that is the great initial starting point. But the key to this though, is when you go to these virtual meetups, you need to follow up. I I know I've, I've seen so many people go to these virtual meetups and then they don't follow up and there's, they're still at the same place. And, you know, whenever I follow up, I always say, hey, I saw that we were in the same meetup. I'm also interested in this market. And I'd love to connect more, learn more about your background and investment goals. Uh, and I would always have asked for their availability first, just because it would show that I am interested and invested in learning about them as a potential partner. Another strategy that I'd really love, and this is more if you are a uh, if you're more a seasoned, a more seasoned investor is jumping on other people's podcasts, being a podcast guest. Reason why I love this is you don't only tap into the invest, the the podcasters audience. You also tap into the other podcasters guests. If you do really well and they know somebody that's, uh, they, they know somebody that you didn't know about so that they could refer you over to and possibly they have another podcast. Um, possibly they could be just, you know, another person that they've interviewed. They can make the introduction. So by you bringing your content and your value to them and granted, hopefully you do a great job on the podcast and they want to invite you back, you know, they can make the referral into their own network that you wouldn't have access to. Uh, the only challenge with this one, though, is you know you definitely have to know your story. You'd have to definitely do a deal, uh, talk about how you got started, and even if it was just like an LP deal in self storage. I mean, jumping on to uh, other people's podcasts is just, still just a great way uh, to uh, to get started and expand your network. The other strategy is hosting your own podcast. Uh, this is one of the best excuses to have a conversation. This one takes a little bit more work, uh, but the reason why I bring this up is there was actually a few partners and also a few GBs that we've worked with that they've only met through a podcast. And keep in mind, you know, when, when people are recording podcasts, there's always conversations before and after the podcast. It's not really just the value of whatever podcast that is creating marketing content for, uh, for your, your audience. It's really the conversations before and after, and then the follow-up of just staying on top of mind and still having an excuse to, to build that relationship and learn more about who they are and what they're doing. And I've seen you know, anywhere from acquisitions to investor relations, even to underwriting, uh, to uh, even, even, even as an underwriter, right? There, where, where people are still connecting through the podcast. And so I think this is, this is an excellent way to build uh, partnerships and relations. And I actually do a whole other webinar on multifamily investor nation and do a deep dive on some of the certain touch points and some of the resources that you need in order to do so uh, and how to add value through this. And that one, it, you can shoot me a message or shoot in the Q&A and I can send you the link to that one as well. 
And then the last strategy, and this one, it requires some capital, is joining a mastermind or mentorship group. People are always talking about your network is your net worth. With this one, yes, there could be a pretty big expense to this, but if you close on your first deal, it would be all covered for. And what really this does is that it just accelerates the process of um, being surrounded one by like-minded individuals, but then also gaining access to their network as well and their attorneys, their lawyers, uh, their property managers that they use. And then also even potentially other general partners that that fulfill uh, strengths and weakness or that fulfill the the weaknesses that you would have um, and could be across the country. And so I always like this one. I personally didn't have the capital to join this mastermind and mentorship group. And so I leveraged the podcast to finagle my way into some of these mastermind and mentorship groups. I even interviewed a, uh, one of the, one of the, the, one of the people that runs a mentorship group. And then I started networking with them. And then eventually everybody saw me as a, uh, as a former, as, as a, informal member just because I knew everybody. I interviewed the coaches and uh, they, that's just another great way to, to break in if you don't have the capital, but I think it's still a, a great and excellent way to accelerate the, the, the journey. And you know, at the end of the day, when we are building these partnerships and you know we are wrapping up, just understands that relationships take time. Like I said, if you're going to be in this for the long run, especially if you're holding for three years, five years, 10 years, you really want to make sure that the partners that you interview trust you. You want to be able to trust them. Uh, You want to make sure that your goals are aligned. Do they have a strong foundation building up before you're stuck? So that is the end of the presentation. I know I went through this pretty quickly, but does anybody have any, I'll, I'll open up the floor to any questions. How did I get into investor relations? That is a great question. So I I met somebody from hosting my own podcast, uh, but then when I met them, I realized that they had a lower, I guess, um, a lower tiered mastermind. It wasn't like where where it, it. charges a chunk of money. Uh, but in this mastermind is disbanded at this time, just cause it was like really, really small. Um, but you know, that was really my, I guess, um, starting ground and starting foundation. And so I would often meet with the same people every week talking about how to, uh, talking about how to, uh, you know, articulate a deal practice my underwriting. Uh, and then eventually after just putting in the work and you know, getting great at articulating the returns, the business plan, and you know, practicing with my family, practicing with them, I ended up working for that operator. Uh, and they eventually wanted me to move to Austin, couldn't do it. And so with this one in particular, long story short, uh, there was, they were actually hiring for investor relations associate over here in the Bay area. And, uh, you know, it ended up just working out, applied and went through the whole interview process. Andrew, our director of investor relations, liked to say that there was a lot of better resumes out there than me, but he said, I was just way more handsome than all of them. And so I like to, to, to take that for what it is. <laughs> no, but, it, but at, at the end of the day, in all seriousness though, I, it really was my work ethic going into it. And so that's how we got with this one personality and just, yeah, working, working with, uh, I guess is a long convoluted answer <laughs> to, to, to your question, but um, it started off with the mastermind of the podcast as I learned to grow. 
Yeah, podcast is called Multifamily Artists. And the uh, episode that I'm referring to, so uh, it was called the Multifamily Artist Podcast. And I separated myself by breaking up the episode into, or breaking up a recording into two episodes. There was, so there's this, uh, a story section where I interview the guest and it was sort of the fall in love with you segment uh, where we just figure out how they get into how they got into multifamily. Uh, and then at the end of it, uh, there would be the action items episode where I treat it as my coaching session, where and that was only like 15 minutes. And so we would record for about an hour, an hour or so. And those 15 minutes were questions that I specifically wanted answered that I didn't, you know, you know, after diving into the story, ice is already broken. I can ask any questions that I, that I really wanted. Um, but the, I guess the episode that I'm referring to in terms of where I got the mentorship group, uh, it's, uh, I ended up getting uh, a call with Gino, Gino Barbaro. And that was, uh, yeah, that was, that was really cool. But then I also got into another mentorship group where they invited me to their underwriting, I guess, underwriting group where they underwrite, underwrote deals uh, every, what, every Thursday. Uh, and that was from a guy named Lauren Jacobs. And so he was part of a, a different mastermind program. And so, uh, I mean, we were talking. When you listen to the podcast, though, you're not going to hear me talk about trying to finagle my way into it. It, it really, the value was before, the, before we actually started recording and then after we were, we were recording. And how has it helped you meet other storage investors? So particularly with storage, just because I was more focused on um, on multifamily, I didn't meet any other storage investors. But with Chris Bennett, who's our uh, general, you know, one of the managing partners for PassiveInvesting.com on the self-storage side, uh, Chris Bennett actually hosted his own podcast as well. And, you know, if you are looking to, connect with other storage investors. Let's say you meet an operator. You could ask that operator, hey, I'm looking to interview other operators within the space. Do you have anybody that you can refer over to? I'd love to learn more about the space. So even if you are just starting out and you're looking to have that particular niche, especially within self-storage, you know there are definitely operators out there that you can interview. And it, like I said, it's a it's such a nice excuse just to record. If if I went over to somebody to let's say another storage operator and I said, "Hey, can you talk to me for an hour?" They wouldn't talk to me for an hour. Like that would be a waste of their time. But if I just said I was recording, if, if I was recording the conversation, give them some marketing material. People just happen to to love it a lot more. They they could put it on their on their social media, educate more people about self-storage and, um, and then just go from there and you can build the relationship from there. Oh, I actually have an allowed to talk button. How can you split up a partnership? Yeah, so when you split up a partnership, let me go back to this other slide that I had. You're typically going to follow uh, fall into these five different, I guess, roles in a particular partnership. You're either going to focus on acquisitions, which is your broker broker relationships, really underwriting the deal, finding the deal. Uh, maybe you're doing off market and just cold calling, trying to get owners. Uh, so this one, uh, you're going to fall between one of these five, uh, typically when when you are splitting up the partnership. Uh, but when you are talking, and maybe this is just some for me to understand the question a little bit more, splitting up the partnership in terms of how do you split up the ownership percentage with investors uh, or how do you split, I guess, how much each takes for uh, as part of the general partnership? Can you elaborate on that question?
Maybe I already answered. I don't know. Speaking on behalf of our self storage team, though, Chris Bennett and John Allen are like the perfect pair uh, when they when they take it on. So I mean, they both have experience out of the family offices or uh, as their own operators. And so Chris Bennett was the sort of the the front man in terms of talking to brokers and networking with brokers and going on tours within the the sites that we were visiting. Uh, but then with Chris. I mean, uh, John Allen, he was the underwriter. Uh, he likes to, he likes to call himself the nerd, but he's the, he's the, uh, he's the financial, uh, financial guy. And so they, they really make a great pair because they both have the same vision in terms of what their criteria that they're looking for, uh, their exit plan that they're looking at, uh, what type of assets that they're trying to add value to the areas that they're also trying to buy in as well. And I'm going to assume that I answered that question. So I'm going to, I'm going to close this one. I answered that live. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm glad. And then also too, you know what, if you have any other questions at all, I probably should have done this a little bit earlier. So my apologies there, but let me, um, let me put my information in there as well. And then we can also hop onto a, a chat. So here's my email. And then here is my number. Yeah. You can also add me on LinkedIn as well. If you'd like, that's my name. Oh, I, got, I can also stop sharing too. All right. There you go. Ooh, contact info should be showing up in the chat box. Here, you know what? I can type the answer here for your Q&A. Oh, there you go. Oh, chat box. This is disabled. Hold on. I got you guys. I got you all. Give me a sec. Can't see it yet. There you go. Oh, let me just do this. All righty. Boom. I'll just respond to everybody. <laughs> there you go. Happy to happy to chat. I appreciate you taking time out of your Tuesday to, to, to sit on this webinar, though. I really appreciate it, uh, just because you can be doing a lot of different things, but you chose to spend your Tuesday with me, so thank you. Okay. Do I personally have a website? Uh, I don't have a website, uh, but passiveinvesting.com does. Uh, and that's where you can also find more info about me as well. Um, you know, I have a, I have an Instagram and then also a Facebook as well. You know, I guess you can also see some of my dance clips before I jumped into this. So that'd be really cool. Uh, but no, not a personal website. Just that one, just passiveinvesting.com. How do you raise capital as a partner? So this was, uh, I mean, this this is a this is a great question, and in, in, in a way, it's sort of like the the chicken and the egg. Uh, but the the 
best way to raise capital, especially if you're just starting out, uh, is taking, well, one, you have to vet different operators yourself to see which operators you want to raise capital for. Uh, but then once you get like, let's say just a sample deal deck uh, for people from people that you like, uh, and let's say like get permission to share that deal with other people, because it could be a private deal. You would have to go and go into your internal network and then build up your own list of soft commits. And so when you when you go to an operator and you say like, hey, I want to you know raise 500,000, they have to believe that you can raise 500,000, for example. Uh, and so if you have that level of soft commits and touch points with your own network and you know it could really be starting out, it doesn't necessarily, when you start out, I always found it challenging saying like, hey, can I pitch you this, uh, this, uh, this deal, this self-storage deal? Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to convert, especially if they're not familiar with self-storage. And so uh, when you, it's, it's, so maybe starting out is just like starting out the conversation of like why self-storage is, is a great investment. Uh, a great investment opportunity. Uh, just keeping it high level first, and then really trying to convert there later. Uh, because the, the the hardest part is the credibility part, right? Like since you've never raised on a on a deal before, they're gonna think like, why am I investing with you? Well, one, if you if you host a podcast or you sort of build your own social currency, people are gonna start seeing you, and as long as you're consistent, people are going to start seeing you aligned with all these other industry professionals. That social currency is extremely important, um, you know. And then, you know, because because they can say, hey, you interviewed this person, you learned from this person, you've been around and hosting this podcast for about you know a year or so, and you're still connecting with them. You've got to be doing something uh, worthwhile. And it, it's really just to try and start up the conversation. But if you go up to somebody and say, hey, let's talk about self-storage, look at the returns that you can get, immediately they, they're going to not trust you right away. And so actually, you know what? I'm going to write down what's, uh, I'm going to write down a book that I think would be really great in terms of, I guess, um, pitching uh, raising well, raising capital for real estate, I think, is a really good one uh, by Hunter Thompson. I'll write it in the chat. And then also, when we are pitching, pitch anything for Orin from by by Orin Cloth uh, is really good to understand how the mind processes information. And so you go through these different layers of how do you establish credibility. Um, but yeah, if you don't have credibility as yourself. You gotta, you gotta use partners to, to leverage that credibility. I ah, appreciate it, TK. Anytime, my pleasure. Do you mind sharing most commonly used business structure used for self-storage and how the investors are related to this investment structure as far as liability? Yeah, so I would say the, the most commonly used business structure, especially for self-storage uh, that I've seen is just a, a typical you know, syndication with a 70-30 split and then a 7% pref. So it's 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 pretty similar to to what we do over here at passiveinvesting.com. And so 70% of the building is owned by the passive investors, 30% is owned by the general partners, and then there is a pref in there. And so that 7% pref, it's not necessarily a return metric, it's more like a feature to the investment. To, to the actual investment opportunity. Uh, the 7% pref doesn't mean that you're going to be getting 7% every single year. You know what, actually, let me, let me pull up uh, one of our deals and I can, I can actually walk you through it. Give me one sec. Y'all are, y'all are getting the, the in 
depth webinar. Let's see. Let me do this. Let me share my screen real quick. Okay. So this is actually one of our, our deals and you can, and I can send you the link here afterwards too. Uh, but this, this is our typical structure. We have a 70, 30 split and then a 7% pref that 7% pref, like I said, is more like a feature. So you see in years one through five there, uh, it's 5.5% year one, 5.8% year two, et cetera, moving forward. Now, what the 7% PREF is, is, is it's more of an alignment of interest for the passive investors uh, for the general partner. So it, this means that the passive investors need to get paid their 7% before the general partners get paid. So for year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, you, we're, you're not hitting 7%. But just because you're not hitting 7% doesn't mean that you lose out on that shortfall. The GPs, the general partners still owe you an amount for that shortfall. So you're still accruing an amount that we would owe you before the general partners get paid and take, take parts of the profit. And then, you know, once I sell it, 70, 30 split up until a 13% IRR. So then once you hit that 7% pref, it goes to 70-30 uh, in how they split the profits. And this is typically more accounted for at the ends when we sell the asset. And then if you once you as the passive investor reaches a 13% return, then the split goes 50-50 for the passive investors and the general partners. Hopefully that helps answer your question, Rommel. And you know what, uh, Rommel, hopefully I pronounce it correctly. Uh, let me, uh, let me actually, I'll share this. I'll share this in the chat too. So if, in case anybody wants to see, you can click that link. Has having a uh, storage investor nation podcast help raise capital? Absolutely. And the thing is with, with, uh, you know, Sometimes when, when people are, uh, what do I call it, having a podcast and the audience isn't necessarily investing, and I'm not saying that the Storage Investor Nation's audience doesn't invest, a lot of operators also invest in other operators' deals. Like it's very common for other operators to invest in each other's deals. So, so like, for example, Dan Hanford. He's not just invested in our deals. He, he's invested in 50 different deals with 17 different operators. And so in a way too, like and operators are looking for other places to put, to, to be an LP as well. Uh, so that's another avenue that Storage Investor Nation has raised capital. So not just from the audience, but from, you know, from other operators that they're talking to. Cool. Loving these questions coming in. Thank you. And I, I know I've said thank you so much, but I really just love the engagement that everybody has here. Favorite thing about being in investor relations? I, I mean, getting to talk to people like y'all. I, I mean, for us, I, one of my big strengths is I really love to just build relationships with the people that, um, well, not, I guess not that I just do business with, but just in general. And so being able to build those relationships, talk through different investment opportunities uh, and aligning uh, our opportunities with their goals, I think is, is just such a cool opportunity. I, I mean, I'm not great at underwriting. I'm not great at cold calling, like I've said. And so this is really just the, the best of both worlds. Um, you know, and yeah, yeah, it's really just the best of both worlds. I absolutely love it. 